Um, today's lecture is um, about speech acts, and uh, I'm going to share the um, slides. All right. Um, so, speech acts is really um, an important topic within uh, within pragmatics um, because, I in many ways, it's one of the two or three main strands that created the field of pragmatics. Okay, that is the work we're gonna we're gonna talk about in a second, but basically the work of Austin uh, and Searle and then Grice. Um, are basically one big strand of pragmatics, and then the other side instead came from sociolinguistics, and to some extent from generative semantics. Which uh, you know, and if you don't know what that is, you don't need to worry about it. But uh, but so my point is, speech act theory very very important historically in um, in uh, pragmatics. Um, so now, where does speech act theory come from? Right. So, so the, the historical background um, is right there. You can see, you can see um, for yourselves. First of all, it started in post-war England, so around the 1945-1950s um, uh, era, um, with the work of two very different um, uh, scholars. Um, and uh, ironically enough, they were um, at one was at Oxford, Austin, the other one was at Cambridge, Wittgenstein. Um, uh, Austin was aware of Wittgenstein and didn't like his work at all. I don't know that Wittgenstein was aware of Austin's work at all. Um, and Austin did not like Wittgenstein at all. The irony is that in fact, they actually are saying roughly the same thing. And then, you know, in many ways they're, they're similar. And so this is one of those things where the concept of zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, as the Germans uh, say, um, it really sort of comes in uh, handy because these ideas were really in the air, right? And so, so they, they express them. So, so what is this, uh, this idea? Well, the idea is that, um, you know, um, it's in a sense, it's a reaction against the logical uh, approaches to semantics that we saw in the in the first uh, lecture, you know the Frege Russell uh, approach of saying, well, you know, natural language is messy. We're going to fix it by having, uh, you know, the, using logic as this way of expressing our ideas clearly without ambiguity and so on and so forth. So, so the ordinary language uh, philosophers such as Austin and Wittgenstein react to this idea and their attitude is to say, there's actually nothing wrong with natural language. It's the other way around. Natural language is a pretty good tool to do what it's supposed to do. It's logic that gets it wrong, right? And uh, so Wittgenstein goes so far as saying, all the propositions of logic are tautologies. In other words, they don't add any knowledge to what we already knew, right? So this is pretty damning. Um, uh, claim, right? And and Austin basically says, well, it doesn't matter what what logic wants to say because ordinary language is what we're interested in. That's that's what we use. Now, and uh, and in fact, Austin sort of has a defense of ordinary language, which which actually makes a lot of sense if you think about it, which is uh, sort of outlined there on the slide uh, for you. Um, I mean, think about it this way. We've been using language, maybe not in its current form of English, but in one form or another, for over ten thousand years. Okay, I mean, you know, probably more like about seventy thousand years. Okay, so a long, long time. It would be very strange if it turned out that language was dramatically inappropriate to doing its job, right? Because, well, for seventy thousand years, millions and millions of people just got it wrong, right? That seems unlikely, right? You know, because I mean, it is a social construct, right? So, so if it didn't work, we would have just given it up and done something else, right? I don't know what else, like you know, flags or or, or you know, wave flags or you know, clap our hands or something, 
Right? But who would have said, well, this language thing, we try and it doesn't work, do something else. Right? So, so the fact that it's persisted for that long, okay? And by the way, we're talking language, not writing, okay? Um, you know, so the fact that it's persisted for that long means that it must somehow work, right? Uh, and so, I mean, that's a pretty powerful argument if you think about it, right? So, so it's unlikely that language is drastically wrong. Yeah? I mean, it may be wrong in some details, yeah? um, you know, but, but by and large, it should be pretty accurate and pretty, pretty effective. Then the other thing that, um, that they point out is that language is a social construct. Okay, much like things like money uh, or um, uh, institutions like marriage, right? I mean, marriage is a human uh, construct, okay? You know, in nature, there are no marriages. I mean, you have animals that pair up and, and uh, stay together for a lifetime. Swans, apparently, um, uh, do this. Uh, and I think some kind of penguins uh, do that as well. Lobsters? Apparently lobsters as well. Mm -hmm. okay, that's, see, now that is disturbing. <laughs> that is very disturbing because I'm if I'm eating a lobster, I'm thinking, am I eating the boyfriend of, of the other lobster? That's terrible. Um, all right, so don't eat lobster. That's that's the conclusion that that we draw from this. You know, but but so so but there are no marriages in nature. You may have you know couplings and whatever, but but to be married. It only exists within a society, okay? Marriage only exists because I went to the courthouse and I go, I paid the seventy dollars and I and I got a piece of paper and I signed it and then another guy signed it and then Lucy signed it and as a result we're married and then I posted it in our bedroom so that every morning she wakes up and goes, "Oh God, <laughs> uh, what did I do?" You know, it's just a tell teach you a lesson. Um, you know, um, you know, so, 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 but it, you know, if that convention didn't exist, there's no way to be married outside of a society. Okay. You and I can say, all right, we're going to be married, but unless there is a society that somehow acknowledges and recognizes that we're married, we're not married. Okay. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. You know, you're only married in so far as your neighbors and, and the police and the, you know, the mayor think you're married. Otherwise you're not married, you know? It's just two people shacking up together. I mean, not that there's anything wrong, anything wrong with that, but I'm just saying you're just not married, right? And don't tell me about common law marriage. That, again, is an institution, right? I mean, the society says, well, and if you shack up for, for more than X number of years, I don't know what it is, five? Five years, apparently, and for lobs are seven. <laughs> uh, you know, so if you shack up for, for, for longer than a certain period of time, then you are, you know, common law married. And again, but that's a convention. Why five and not 10, you know, or 15 or 20 or, or whatever, right? So, so the idea then is that these social facts, you know, only exist as conventions, right? And, and this analysis is due to Durkheim, who's a sociologist, a French sociologist, okay? So the best example I know of is money, okay? Money is paper on which that has been printed, okay? But it's a social convention that it's worth stuff, you know? And if you don't believe me, take a piece of paper, write on it $1 and take it to the grocery store and see if they give you any groceries. And the answer to that is no. And if in fact, if you imitated the dollar well enough, they put you in jail, okay? Completely unreasonably in my mind, okay? Why? Because, well, there's a set of conventions who's allowed to print dollars, you know? And apparently it's only the US government. I think it's an unfair uh, circumstance, but okay, whatever. Um, but it's not that the dollar bill is valuable because the print, uh, the, the paper costs 95 cents and the ink costs five cents, you know, no. It probably costs pennies to make a dollar, even less, you know, virtually nothing. But it's valuable because we have a convention that if I go to the store and I give the, the merchant a dollar, I get something for a dollar. And if I give them two, I get more stuff, right? Um, you know, and it used to be that you could go to a bank and exchange it in gold. But that ended in 1975 um, in the Nixon administration. They said, screw that. And we, we're, there's no longer a uh, connection between gold and, um, and the dollar, right? So it's completely arbitrary 
number. You know, in today's day and age, you're Bitcoin. Same thing, except in cyberspace, right? If, if people are willing to give me money because I have a bunch of Bitcoins, that's, then you can take the money. And, and uh, you know, that's the way it is. It's a convention. If everybody accepts Bitcoins, then, then, then we're good with Bitcoins. If everybody accepts dollars, then we're good with dollars, right? But it is a social um, convention. Now, Wittgenstein was a fascinating uh, thinker. He was a very strange individual, um, very intense. Um, and, uh, you know, basically, he wrote one of the most difficult books in philosophy, uh, catchily titled The Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. And you have to say, that is, you know, talking of good titles, that is fun. Logical Philosophical Treaties. You know, if that doesn't want to make you read it, um, in which, uh, you know, basically he um, presents a theory of how things mean, and uh, trust me, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, the, the whole book consists of seven sentences, and the rest is glosses to these seven sentences. You know, not, again, as I said, not, not casual reading uh, there. Um, and in this book, he basically claimed that he had solved every problem of philosophy, you know, before and after, and that there was basically there, need, there needn't need be any more books of philosophy because he'd answered every question that there was. And that was pretty impressive. Um, and he was serious, by the way. Okay, they gave him a PhD at Cambridge because of this. Russell said, I have no idea what you're talking about, but boy, does it sound impressive, so we'll give you a PhD. And then made him a professor. I mean, you know, it was that, that smart. Now, this was in 1918, um, 19, I guess. Um, so then there were a number of things, and, you know, he built a house for his sister, went and taught uh, as, a high, as an elementary school in Austria, hated his, his pupils. Um, but and eventually he made it to uh, to Cambridge, and um, you know turned in the book as his dissertation, and they they um, they made him a professor. He then spent the rest of his life basically saying everything I said in that book is wrong, and here's my new theory which is right. Okay. Uh, he never finished the book. It appeared uh, it appeared uh, posthumous. But in you know in this book he presents a um, completely different view of of language and meaning, which includes things like this. So, for example, one of the most important points that he makes is that the meaning meaning of a word is the way it's used. Okay, so the the meaning of a word is it's used in language, right? So so words don't have Meaning is not like given to you by God. It's not uh, a correspondence to a referent. It's how the word is used in language that that's the meaning of the word. Okay. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, the idea is that uh, philosophy is wrong when it asks things like, what is the meaning of be? Right, the verb to be. It says that there is no meaning. Is just that the verb to be is used in English in a certain way. And to start asking that kind of question is a mistake. And that's when you get it wrong, and that's when you get in, in, ensnared in philosophical problems, is when you start saying, well, if everything that is is, what isn't, what is the nature of what isn't? Which is a typical problem from, from uh, Greek philosophy, the nature of non be. Okay? No one knows what the nature of non-being, because there is no such thing as the nature of non-being, because this is a philosophical problem, i.e. a fake problem, because language, natural language, doesn't make these mistakes. When you say the door is closed, you know exactly what is the meaning of is in that particular context. It means you can't get through, right? And, and that's it. And there is no other meaning or, or anything like that. Um, you know, and so, so um, you know, another contribution that he made, and uh, this is where it is eerily close to then um, Austin and Searle, is this idea of language games. Um, he, he basically had this intuition, well, not an intuition, so, so, you know, years and years of thinking about it, that language is used for different purposes. And uh, he compared these purposes to games. Right? 
and he said, you know, if you look at the category of games like chess and soccer and, and whatever, um, you know, um, you don't, um, there is not one category that all games share. Okay. But instead, what you have is that some games all use a ball, and some games use dice, and some games use a board, and some games are done with words, and some games are done by running around and hiding. And they all share something, but not there is no one thing that's shared by everybody. And it causes a family resemblance, right? So if you if you look at pictures of your relatives, right, and you, you know, you're gonna see that you know little Jimmy has the nose and the, you know the hair and but, but not everybody has one thing that everybody has the same, right? Um, you know, and so, so he gives uh, some examples uh, of, uh, of this. And so you have a list there, you know, giving orders, uh, reporting an event, uh, making a hypothesis, making up a story, uh, guessing at riddles, creating a riddle, telling jokes, you know, that, that kind of thing. All of these are different activities that you can engage in. And the rules of using language are going to be different in every activity. So the rules of telling a joke are different than the rules of, of telling a new story. Okay, and, and if you confuse the two, you're going to get in trouble. Okay, because, because it's not going to work, right? The rules of reporting an event are different from the rules of speculating. When you're speculating, you can say, well, but what if... Um, you know, the, the earth was flat, right? Oh, we're speculating, sure, you know, well, people would fall off the, 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 the side, you know, and die, right? That's, that's not good, right? So, so then that's a speculation, but that's different from the rules of what happened today in Washington, D.C., right? Oh, well, you know, the president gave a speech. No, he didn't, he didn't give any speech. Oh, well, I was speculating. No, you can't do that, right? If you're reporting a fact, you have to only say things that everybody agrees happened, right? That you can sort of document and, and you have like a video of it or something like that, right? So, so that's, that's what Wittgenstein is, is talking about, is that what counts as good use of language is gonna change depending on what it is that you're doing, okay? All right, so now we go to Austin, um, the, the, the granddaddy of um, a speech act uh, theory. And he um, was a, was a, he wrote very little uh, in his in his lifetime. The book came out uh, posthumous. Uh, he he died before it, it was ready. Um, and uh, uh, you know the title is 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 a very good title, as we were saying uh, earlier, um, because because it's one of those titles that really summarizes things, and that that's exactly what the book is about: how to do things using words, right? Um, you know, and um, the, it's a strange book in many ways. You can tell that it's not, it's not finished because the first half of the book is dedicated to the theory of performativeness, right? And Austin says, well, there are, you know, when you say something, you're making something happen by the fact of saying it. So, so if I say, I promise not to give too many strange examples in this lecture, I'm now committed to doing this. Right? By the very fact that I said I promised, I am now committed to doing that. Right? So that's a performative because it made the action by stating the action, I made it happen. Okay? If I say I curse you, you are cursed. Right? So, so you made it happen by saying so. When the umpire says you're out to the baseball player, the baseball player is out. If the umpire isn't paying attention and, and the baseball player does whatever would get them uh, thrown out, the baseball player is not out. Only when the, the, the umpire says you're out, you're out. In chess, if you don't say checkmate, there is no checkmate. Even if objectively your pawns are, you know, your pieces of your, of your chess are in a position of checkmate. So, um, so he introduces this idea of performativity and then for about half of the book tries to argue that everything is a performative. And then he says, well, on second thoughts, no. <laughs> It just doesn't work that way, right? And instead, he says, we really need to distinguish three levels of speech act within every utterance, okay? That is, any time that you say something, there are really three different levels at which you're doing something. Remember, it's how to do things with words. 
So there is the locutionary, the elocutionary, and the perlocutionary uh, act. And uh, here we've got uh, a slide with that. So the locutionary act is saying something, okay? So producing the actual sounds, you know, and then saying actual specific words, right? So, so if I say, um, you know, you're out, I am saying the word, I'm producing the sounds, you, uh, r, a, u, t, okay? So I'm producing these sounds, and I'm also saying the words you, are, and out, okay? So that is the locutionary uh, act. Now, also part of the locutionary act is who's you? Right, well, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to you, so you is you, right? If I was looking at someone else, then I'd be speaking to someone else, or maybe I mean someone else. So, so the re, the re, determining who's the referent of the, who's the addressee, for example, would be part of that, or an aphora, or that kind of thing. Then you have the illocutionary act, which is essentially what act is the speaker trying to accomplish by saying whatever they say. So in the case of your out, I am the umpire, I'm achieving the act of letting the, making the, the player be out, okay? If I said, um, um, you know, I'm kneeling with a ring and, and uh, uh, you know, Dr. Picker in there, I said, will you be my wife? And she says, yes, um, you know, then, then I'm asking for her hand, or I'm asking her to marry, right? So that's the, the, um, uh, the thing. Um, I did not get on my knees. If we were in mid the middle of Rome, it would have been embarrassing. <laughs> uh, um, but we were right next door to the Fountain of Trevi. Oh. <laughs> See, uh, it's like, because she had said, you don't propose to me at the Fountain of Trevi, because she knew we were going to go see the Fountain of Trevi. She knew like it's the most, one of the most romantic places on earth. Because you, know, you know that there's this legend that you throw a coin in the fountain, that means that you will come back with your beloved. And so it's like, oh, yeah. So I was like, oh, she's like, you cannot propose to me. The <laughs> so, because I'm a linguist, I was like, okay, we're no longer in the fountain of faith. We're in the square adjacent to the fountain of faith. Will you marry me now? <laughs> she said, okay, fine. <laughs> That's exactly how it went. Uh, in fact, we were right next to a bunch of trash because they, they, they had not cleaned up the. Listen, reality is what it is. Um, all right, so, so in this case, I was, I was still romantic. I was trying to get, uh, you know, her to marry me, right? So that was my, my illocutionary, uh, illocutionary act was to ask for her hand and not to ask her in marriage, right? Um, you know, you can, um, you know, promise something that when what you're trying to achieve is that you're promising something. Uh, if you're threatening somebody, what you're trying to achieve is that you're threatening them, right? So that's the action that you're trying to do. Now, then you have the perlocutionary act, and that's the one that trips up everybody. The perlocutionary act is the effect of whatever the speaker said on the whole situation. Okay. Whether the speaker intended it or not, and that's what confuses the bejesus out of people. Okay, because it is it is actually difficult to wrap your head your your head around it. But that's unequivocally what Austin uh, uh, says. You know, so um, you know, if you want to scare somebody as a joke, and you go boo, and the person jumps up and has a heart attack that person dying is your perlocutionary act. It's one of the consequences of your saying boo, okay? But you'd never intended for them to die. You know, that's not, that wasn't your goal at all. Well, but it happened. So, you know, whether it's intended or unintended, there's still a consequence of what you did. So it's your perlocutionary act. And that is really, again, as I said, we really don't want that to be the case, but, you know, Austin is very, very explicit about this. That, that's what he uh, means. Now, uh, and the other thing is uh, you may or may not succeed in your perlocutionary goal, not act goal, uh, and that's fine, okay? So, so the example that I have there, there is, you know, you say to your kid, don't go in the basement because there's monsters and they're going to eat you, 
right? And you're thinking, all right, now they're scared, they're not gonna go. And the kid goes, ooh, monsters, that sounds really interesting, and goes into the basement anyway, right? So your, your perlocutionary goal failed, you know, your relocutionary and locutionary worked because you tried to scare them, but, but it didn't work. They, they were not scared, they were in fact made curious, and so it didn't, it didn't work, okay? Um, you know, the same thing, you know, now I'm lecturing, so my goal is to inform you of the brilliance of this, and if you're bored, then I fail, you know, but, you know, that, that is nonetheless an unintended consequence of my, of my speech act, right? So that would be the perlocutionary act, okay? Now, and again, each speech act has all three at the same time, okay? So, so one of the points that people don't usually realize is you're doing three things at a time whenever you say anything. Because there's always three. There's the, always the locutionary, always the elocutionary, and always the perlocutionary act. They're always there. You cannot just say, oh, let me do a locutionary act and nothing else. It, it doesn't work that way. You, you, you have to do all three at the same time. <laughs> all right, so um, John Searle took uh, this, this idea and sort of ran with it. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so first of all, he um, uh, goes back to the Durkheim insight that we, that we said, although I don't think he mentioned Durkheim. I, I, I would need to double check. I don't, I don't think he does. But, but he points out, again, that these are conventional, right? Here you see conventional, um, you know, and, and that, um, you know, the rules of language are conventional. Right, so in other words, there is nothing necessary about it. Remember, the arbitrariness of the sign. This is the same kind of line, line of reasoning. Okay, um, you know, and um, you know, and that these rules are constitutive rules, in the sense that if you take the rules away, there's nothing left. Okay, the example there is is particularly uh, adequate, and I think it is in in uh, in Searle. I don't think I made it up. So if you're playing chess. Right? Following the rules of chess is playing chess. If you say, you know what, let's uh, start moving the queen any way we want, or, or the, the knight moves uh, any way we want, you're no longer playing chess. You're playing something else, which may use the pieces of chess, but it's no longer chess. Now, conversely, if you're running, you know, I can be running competitively, you know, there's me running, trying to catch Hussein Bolt, who's like miles ahead. Um, you know, Okay, so, but forget about uh, com competitively. I can be running to catch the, the train or the bus that, that, you know, so I'm running, but I'm still running, even though I'm not in a stadium and I'm not wearing, you know, the, the special shoes and, and all of that, I'm still running, right? So in other words, running is running regardless of rules and competition and whatever. Chess stops being chess if you change the rules. There's nothing left, it's no longer chess. Okay, so that's the difference between constitutive and uh, and non and non constitutive rules, and and language is made of constitutive rules. That is, if the moment you break the rules of language, there's nothing left. Okay. Um, all right, and so there are institutional facts as well. Uh, you know. So so Searle says, and this is where it gets uh, slightly more more complicated. So remember the concept of proposition from. Predicate calculus, uh, formal logic, uh, you know, the first, uh, the first lecture, every sentence expresses a proposition, which is then either true or false. And the truth, of, uh, you know, and then you, the meaning of the sentence, you look at the truth, you go into the world, you check whether it's, the proposition is true or false, and then that's your truth value, all right? So Searle says, great, that's all true. No, not a problem with that, says, says Searle. However, the elocution of a speech act can be of five different types, each of which you're still expressing the same proposition, but you're expressing it with a different force, okay? So you can state it as an assertion, right? Or I can say, it is now 5.30 p.m., right? That's a statement, that's an assertion, and no, 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 no problem. Um, you can request it, okay? Now, in this case, it, do, it doesn't work because you cannot say, May, please let it be 5 p.m., mm -hmm. right? That the well, yeah, and I guess to go or something. But, uh, but I can say, you know, uh, give me the, the phone, 
right? So, so, so that's a request, right? And, and uh, so, so, of course, the, the idea is there is a phone, right? So give me the phone is, so move the phone to me, right? So, so it's a request in that sense. A promise is, you know, I'll, I'll give you a phone if you do something. Uh, warning is, uh, you know, um, don't let that be a phone, right? I've forbidden you to bring bringing phones in class, and and uh, if that is a phone, you're in deep trouble, right? So that would be that would be a thing, and a yes no question would be: Is this a phone? You know, it's, it's, this is a phone. Yes, no. Right? So, so that's that's a, that's a, right? so. So the idea then is that you still have the one proposition: This is a phone, right? But then that can be presented in a number of ways with a different force. As a statement, this is a phone. As a request, give me the phone. As a promise, I'll give you a phone. Uh, as a warning, if this is a phone, you're in trouble. And as a no question, is this a phone? Okay? So it's the same proposition, this is a phone, but with different force. Okay? That's the crucial um, uh, idea behind behind speech act uh, theory. The proposition remains the same, the force of the elocution changes, okay? All right, so moving on. Um, so then, then Searle says, we can then classify um, speech acts into five um, uh, categories, um, you know, which are the kind of things that you can do with Right, and so, so he's, he's, he's going back to, uh, to Austin there. So you have assertives, uh, which are, you know, it's like statements, claims, reports, you know, he said, you know, yesterday it was raining, right? So that would be an assertive. Directives that are requests, you know, like give me the phone or, or, um, or um, I, I, I advise you to give me the phone or, or um, you better give me the phone, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, expressive, there are things like, uh, you know, uh, I'm sick and tired of this phone, right? Or, or um, uh, well, thank you for bringing the phone, that, 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 kind, that kind of thing. Uh, Commissions is where you commit yourself to something, right? So, so this would be, I promise to give you a phone, um, I'll never give you a phone. Um, let's see, what else uh, would be a commission? Um, with a phone example? Well, <laughs> with anything. Uh, like well, can it something, be, there's not a promise. Without the strong IFAB, it could be, uh, I'll get the milk after class and talk to a spouse kind of. Right, but that's still a promise, right? It's like, uh, it's, um, uh, well, you, you could say, uh, I won't go. Uh, okay, that's a refusal, right? So you say, well, we're going to the theater, uh, you know, tomorrow. I won't go. Right? So you're committing yourself uh, to not, uh, to not going. Uh, making an appointment. I'll see you tomorrow at three. Right. That's that's a promise to be there. If, if then tomorrow I don't show up, you'll be like, "Ah, we're worried, right?" Because because I was committed to to doing that. Okay. So setting up an appointment is making a commitment that you're going to be at the at the appointment. Um, what else is it creates a, creates a commitment? Um, well, buying on credit. Uh, you know, is, is, I mean, that's not. Uh, oh, by the way. Speech acts don't have to be made with speech. Okay, you can make uh, you know actions that are speech acts. Okay, so for example, buying on credit is a good example. You could walk into a store, pick up uh, a book, put it on the counter, give the the person your credit card. So far, no no words have been exchanged, right? And assume that the the uh, uh, clerk is uh, is you know not you know a talky person that that's you know is or maybe you've annoyed them so they just take your card swipe it give you the book give you your receipt you know so no words have been exchanged but you bought a book and you made a promise that you're going to pay that price that you charged on your credit card right so buying on credit is a commissive you're saying i will pay what i you know am supposed to pay eventually um, and so then you have declaratives that are things like performances, right? That, that, that was where, where it all started. You know, my favorite one is class dismissed, right? Which is like, all right, so, so, and, all right, so, um, let me see, do I have, uh, 
No, I don't. All right. So, so one thing that we need to talk about is felicity uh, conditions, uh, which which I don't have a slide for apparently. Um, so, so class dismissed is is a good example uh, uh, for this. So let's say uh, now that um, you know you say class dismissed. Go ahead. Classes. Right. Except it didn't work. Right. The reason that it didn't work is because, of course, you're not the teacher of the class, right? Um, whereas if I had said it, because I am the teacher of the class, then, then the class would be over, right? Um, you know, and um, uh, I remember when I, was, uh, when I was a teacher my first year or so, when the time would come roughly that the class was over, the students would start getting up and be like, what are you doing? <laughs> and the students would be like, well, you know, leaving I'm like uh -uh, i haven't dismissed class sit down and then i would have them open the textbook and i'd give them an assignment they hated me but it was fun <laughs> um you know I, after a while of course they stopped doing it right because you know they learned very quickly that if they tried to get up before i dismissed class they'd get an extra assignment right so so they were not happy campers um you know so however now let's imagine that i also um you know as you're all leaving and as you're all walking out of the door, I say, class dismissed. What's wrong with that? We're already going. Right. Therefore? Class is no longer in session. The class is no longer in session, right? So I can only dismiss a class that's currently in session, right? Mm -hmm. If the class is not in session, I can't dismiss it. I cannot call you at 2 a.m. and say, <laughs> class dismissed. <laughs> And you'd be like, what? So well, I'm just letting you know, class is over. So it's out. It's been over for seven hours. So well, just in case you were wrong. Right? Yeah, I'd be like, okay, no, that, that ain't good. Right? Okay, so fine. So the class has to be in session. Very good. What if uh, I had dismissed class 12 seconds after starting? Right? I mean, I, technically I can, but you would have said, well, that was really weird, mm -hmm. right? What happened? You know, I mean, did somebody, you know, say something that it didn't like? You know, did somebody, you know, call him fatso or something and he got really mad? You know, I don't know. Um, um, <clears throat> so, so, you know, that would be a very strange thing to do, to dismiss class after 12 seconds, right? And, you know, you, you would complain to the dean and say, you know, Dr. Atardo dismissed class after 12 seconds. Like that's, that's bad, right? So, so that's not, you know, not, I mean, it's, it's sort of a dark area because in a gray area, maybe I can, but really I shouldn't, right? You know, um, you know well, so, so if instead of saying class dismissed, I said, get out of my face. I'm sick and tired of seeing all your homework. Yes, no, is, is this normal? Is it, is it acceptable? Not really, right? I mean, it doesn't work, so, but why not? What's wrong with that? Because of societal rules? Yes. Accepted conventions? Correct, yes. It's, it's, it's unacceptable language for the situation. It's inappropriate, okay? That is, it's expected that a professor has a certain decorum and that I would say, I have concluded my brilliant uh, lecture. Feel free to leave. I have no longer, I have no more wisdom to impart at this point in time. You are free to leave. You know, instead of saying, get out of my face. You know, okay, so, so, yeah. well, it would be vastly more entertaining if you said, get out of my face. But okay, I digress. Um, you know, so, so the point here is that there's a bunch of rules and regulations that are necessary for the class to be properly dismissed. It has to be a professor that has to do it. The professor has to be teaching that particular class. If I went to Bill Board's <laughs> class and said, class dismissed. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I'm gonna do it the next, next week. I'm just gonna do it just to see those, uh, like, like those linguists like, I hit again. <laughs> Sal must be lecturing on, on speech act theory yet again. <laughs> uh, he teaches philosophy, so he knows, probably knows what I'm talking about. Um, you know, so you can only dismiss your own class, right? It has to be during the class. It shouldn't be after 12 seconds. 
It should be at the end of a class period class period. It should be done with appropriate language, etc, etc, etc. There's there's a lot more. Yes. You have to have students show up. Very good. <laughs> if I'm sitting here by myself and I say class for <laughs> students, yeah, that'd be kind of weird too, right? <laughs> People would be like, oh, you know, <laughs> sounds a bit again, <laughs> dismissing class. Yeah. Uh, right. So, so, so all of these are felicity conditions. Okay, in other words, in order for a speech act to be felicitous, all of these requirements, these conditions have to be met, okay? And, uh, you know, every speech act has its own set of felicity conditions, okay? So for in order to promise something, first of all, you have to uh, be able to deliver, right? If I say, I promise you the sun will rise tomorrow, you know, well, that's great, but, you know, what, what power do I have to, to stop the sun from rising? Right? No, no, I can't do that. If I say, I promise you I'm going to give you a seven hour lecture at which you will all have to sit there and you know, be, be like, oh, that's not really a promise. That's more of a threat, mm -hmm. right? Because in order for something to be promised, I must assume that you want that. Or it's a good thing that I'm promising, right? If I'm promising a bad thing, it's a threat. That's not a promise. Um, and there's a bunch of them. I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. going to try and remember, remember them all. But I mean, the point is, that there is a set of conditions from a promise to be um, to be a promise and not something weird. Okay, um, you know, mostly that have to do with the fact that the, the hearer thinks it's a good thing, that the speaker is capable of of delivering it. And then the speaker wasn't going to do it anyway, mm -hmm. right? If I say I promise you that tomorrow morning I'll have breakfast, what kind of a promise is that? Because you know I'm going to have breakfast anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not as if that you know. So, so in order to in order to promise properly, felicitously, it has to be something that may not happen, right? And that and that I have control. I, the speaker, has control uh, over it happening or not. Right? Um, so, so felicity conditions are, are really are really crucial in defining in defining speech acts. Okay. So then, uh, not only do speech acts have felicity conditions, they also have realization patterns. Um, and, and basically, it's all the ways in which a speech act can be performed, okay? And so needless to say, the realization pattern of any speech act is potentially infinite, okay? Because there is any number of ways that you can perform a speech act, right? Um, so earlier, you know, the example um, that you made uh, uh, with, was without the politeness, right? So. So you can do all requests, can be done politely, can be done impolitely, can be done as imperatives, bold imperatives, you know, so you can say, open the window. Please open the window. Could you open the window? Would it bother you to open the window? Is it too much to ask you to open the window? I'm sorry to, to bother you and, uh, you know, feel free to say no if that is too much uh, to ask of you, but I would really appreciate it if you could consider close, opening the window. Now you right? sound British. Now you sound British, <laughs> yes. You know, so, so, so you can make increasingly complicated, you know, hyper polite uh, forms of, uh, mm -hmm. of requests, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the number of realization patterns is potentially infinite, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then, of course, they have classes where, where you have polite versus non polite, you have direct versus indirect, because, mm -hmm. you know, the other thing is I can say, you know, would you consider opening the window, right? Where technically I'm not asking you to open the window, I'm asking you to think about opening the window, right? And, and this is a very nice uh, segue to indirect speech acts, right? So I think I planned these lectures. <laughs> um, you know, where, where that's exactly what is happening is that you have um, a, um, a speech act that is performed by performing another one. Okay, so so this is a, a standard example: is can you pass the salt? Okay, so if I ask you, can you pass the salt? Usually, what you do is just give me the salt, right? Because it's interpreted as a request for salt. But in fact, technically, what you're doing is inquiring as to your capacity to pass the salt. Okay. Much like before, I was technically inquiring as to whether you would think about opening the window. 
uh, would you consider opening the window, right? It's like, I'm asking you to think about it. Now, if I ask you to think about opening a window, or if I ask you whether you're capable of passing the salt, how many people can reasonably not be able to pass the salt? Well, okay, people who are paralyzed, okay? But generally speaking, you don't have to wait until you're eating soup to find out whether they're paralyzed or not. You're kind of aware that they're paralyzed, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, same thing. What, under what circumstances could be said, would you consider X and say, no, I'm, I'm way too tired to consider anything. I've, I've done all the thinking that I could do for the day, <laughs> so I'm sorry, you know. Yeah. No, I mean, like, even me, after, at the end of my lecturing, I'm still considering things left and right, because it's a very easy thing to do, right? So, so why bother asking whether I'm willing to consider something or whether I'm able to pass the salt? Well, because by asking what is called a preparatory condition for the performance of the act, you're in fact asking for the act to be performed, except with a distance that makes it polite. Okay, so we will see this when we talk about politeness, but politeness in many ways is about distance. It's about distancing yourself from something that is impolite, a face threatening act, where you ask somebody to do something. They don't want to do it, they want to be left alone, but you bother them. So by distancing yourself from the bothering, it makes it less impolite. Okay? Um, you know, so. <clears throat> So again, in, a, in, a, in an indirect speech act, you perform one speech act superficially, but in fact, you're performing another speech act by the means of performing the first speech act, right? So here, if you say, are you able to pass the salt, right? You're in fact saying, please pass the salt, okay? And so, so that's an indirect speech act, right? Um, so, so then Searle says indirect speech acts are super important, and of course they are, okay? And uh, what you need in order to understand the, uh, an indirect speech act is, of course, speech act theory, obviously, so otherwise you wouldn't even know what you're talking about. The cooperative principle, which we're going to talk about next week, and that's Grice's uh, theory, very interesting. And then you need shared background of information. That is, you need to know the context in which this is happening, uh, etc. And then the capacity to make inferences. In other words, it's an inferential matter that you did this, right? So if I say it's hot in here, okay, then you might say, would you like me to open the window, right? So by saying it's hot in here, I'm like, okay, technically it's the declarative. Right? I'm describing the situation, the temperature in this room is, is on the hot side, right? That's it, that's all I'm doing. But then you, you reason, well, why is he bothering to tell me the fact that it's hot, which is pretty obvious because you know, we're all sweating bullets here, mm -hmm. right? So, so then he must have another reason for telling me that it's hot in here. What might that reason be? There's a window right here, right? And I'm closer to the window than he is. Or maybe he's particularly lazy, right? <laughs> and so we don't know that, right? But that would be part of your background information, right? Um, or maybe by part of the background information is that we're in fact in an episode of Downtown Alley and uh, Abbey, and I am, um, you know, the Lord, and you are one of the servants. Then, then you know that part of your job is to guess what the Lord wants, right? And so if I say it's hot in here, say. Would you like me to open the window, sir? Mm -hmm. so, yes, thank you. Right. So, so that's how that's how it was. But you're, the point is, you're thinking about it. You have to reason to figure out why is this person saying what it is that they're saying, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, and so, so then that's what makes an indirect speech act is that you're on the surface performing one speech act, but in fact, deeply, you're performing another one. Mm -hmm. You know, and, there, and there is a, 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 a set of rules in the, in the principle of cooperation that tells you how to get from the surface speech act to the deep one. All right. Um, all right, so, so um, um, you know, as I, as I said, there's, there's many ways of doing, of doing this. 
So one way is uh, asking for a preparatory condition. Uh, so in the case, can you pass the salt? Um, another one is to perform a directive by asking whether the proposition is in fact true, right? Uh, you know, so the, the example there is, good. will you stop making that noise? Okay, what I'm saying is stop making that noise. I'm not really interested, in, I don't want the person to say, oh, eventually, yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, sure, you know, we all die, you know, so, so I, I, eventually I, I'll get tired and go home and sleep, right? You know, but you know, I, I want you to stop now, right? So, so that's, the, the, um, that's another thing. And, and the reason that this is important, that, uh, that um, you know, there are classes, is that these things become conventionalized. Okay, so, so much so that can you pass the salt? Often, when I use this as an example, the students can't see it as anything but a request. And you have to say, no, 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 look at what the language is actually saying. It's not pass the salt, it's are you capable of passing the salt? Because it's become so, so much of an idiom that now we just think of it as just a request. But in fact, it's not, it's, it's, much, more, uh, it's much more than that. Um, you know, because, because it becomes, it becomes idiomatic and so it's, um, it's entrenched in, into the language. All right, so one final um, uh, point and then we'll call Dr. Pickering to uh, deliver her part of, of the lecture on, uh, on the teaching part. Um, this is a very important uh, uh, thing, which, which people don't usually talk much about. Um, for some speech acts, not all of them, okay, but for some speech acts, um, to perform the speech act means incurring into an obligation. You're committing yourself to doing something, right? So if I say, I promise to buy you ice cream, right, to the children who are you know, being annoying, and I said, if you're quiet, I promise to buy you ice cream, right? I have incurred an obligation to actually buy the ice cream, right? Now, how is that so? That is, what, what makes it an obligation, right? Now, I notice that, again, it's not true of every speech act, okay? If I say the sky is blue, I've not incurred an obligation of making the sky blue, okay? I just made a report, and, if, and I may be right or wrong, but I'm under no obligation to make it happen that way, okay? But if I say, um, I'm gonna bring you cake, if I don't show up with cake, you, you're, you're entitled to call me and say, hey, where's my cake, right? Because I incurred into an obligation. Um, now, obviously it's not a physical obligation, right? I mean, if I say to the children, uh, you know, Shelby says to, to, to Essie and Mylan, I'm buying you ice cream, right? The children are gonna say, well, you said you were gonna buy ice cream, so then let, let's frog march you to the ice cream shop and, and you know, force you physically to buy us ice cream. Right? That's not the way it works. I mean, the children may try, but any reasonable adult will, will sort of shoo them away. And that's the end of the attempt by the children to physically force you to go buy the ice cream, right? So, so you know, that's not that's just not the way it works, right? I mean, and if, if you, among adults, if I said, uh, you know, Hilal, I'm buying you ice cream, then I say, well, I'm not gonna buy you ice cream. If then Hilal grabs me by the, by the neck and, and drags me to the, to the ice cream shop, she'll get arrested <laughs> for, for violence and, uh, and uh, you know, whatever, but not me. You know, the police will say, Really? He promised you ice cream? Say, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Then I reneged on it. Well, that's, that's not a crime, right? So, so you're not under a physical or legal obligation to buy the ice cream, okay? Now, question, an interesting question, and this one is really an open question. It's not a, it's not a uh, fake question. Are you morally obliged to buy the ice cream? Like for, for those at home, they're really, okay, actually, you know what, I'm going to, uh, since this is the last share slide. So, are you morally obliged to buy the ice cream? That, these are the faces <laughs> that I was getting before. I feel like I spot. would feel morally obligated to get it out of connections to maybe like a religious thing, like, oh, you have to keep your 
you know, institutions there. Does that make sense? All right. So you're saying on a religious standpoint, uh, your religion says you shouldn't lie to, you shouldn't lie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Very good. So, so, so then the moral code that's outside of the uh, problem. So the fact that you promise the ice cream is irrelevant. You just shouldn't lie. Right. So, so basically you're saying, no, it's not the promise that makes it morally reprehensible is the fact that you said something that wasn't true, right? So if I said the sky is red, I would be morally reprehensible from a religious standpoint because I've said something false knowingly, right? Um, you know, and so, so it would be a lie, much like I'll, I'll buy the ice cream when in fact I'm not gonna buy the ice cream. Right, yeah. so that's one, that's, one, that's one solution to say it's a religious uh, uh, yeah. Well, in terms of keeping promises, I was thinking um, not obviously it's moral too because you the convention is you don't make promises you can't keep. But I'm. But well, wait, I, you're making a jump here. Is it moral? I mean, well, making that, promises that you cannot keep may be, you know, mean spirited, etc. But but is it immoral? Does it go against morality? To me, no. It's more like if I'm keeping a promise, it's because I value the relationship. Ah, very good. Very good. <laughs> and in fact, um, you know, the, the, the point that, uh, that I have there on the slide at the bottom is that it is a social obligation. That is that you, by making a promise, you're committing yourself here I am on the, on the screen. You're committing yourself. Uh, you're committing yourself in front of society to delivering what you said you were going to do. And if you don't do so, you're not morally bad. You're socially bad. And what's going to happen is that your neighbors and your relatives and your children will say, Sal is a bad person because he said he was going to get us ice cream and then he did it. And then the next time that you try to bribe somebody with ice cream, they'll say, yeah, right. We know how it goes. You're not going to get us the ice cream anyway, so screw you. Okay, and then, and then you know, you will die alone. As you know. <laughs> Sorry. Minor, minor. No, you joke. got that wedding license. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, but that's this is, but that's where the legal obligation comes in. That's, <laughs> that's, like uh, that's how I totally suckered for it. I was like, aha, <laughs> see, it says here, you're married to me. Can't get out of it. Yeah. I'm not getting you ice cream after all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, actually, if, if the woman would eat ice cream or sweets, <laughs> it'd be like, oh, so much. Like, she just don't like it. It's fascinating. Anyway. Um, okay, so so the, the the obligation is a social obligation, which makes sense because remember, speech acts are a social fact, right? You know, language is a social fact, so the obligation that you're incurring is a social obligation. Mm -hmm. right? It makes it makes sense. Yeah. All right. 